semester. So this is the first one with Lean Six, six. six Sigma, and I'll introduce Tasso shortly to you. Um, the other three classes that we have coming are getting promoted with Ed, with Ed Berghard, Inventive Problem Solving for Business with Herbert Roberts, and Life Balance with Life Coach Jennifer Blair. So those start at 6 o'clock in the evening also. Um, there's a $10 registration fee. So we do welcome you back for some of those. I'd like to go ahead and get started here and announce to you tonight is our Lean Sick Sigma course. And Tasso Georgiakoulos. Very good. Very <laughs> I've good. been practicing all afternoon, so <laughs> <laughs> I figured I'd have a good. Um, he comes to us with many years of experience in this field, and this is an overview. I see he's done half of my work for me on exactly <laughs> 12 words or less what the class is about. So without further ado, I'll let him get started. Um, I'm sure he'll make it much more interesting than I can make it right now. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Again, my name is Tasha's Georgopoulos. Rolls off the tongue, right? Um, T will work. Tasha will work to Georgopoulos a little too much, right? So, so we'll leave it at that. Um, I work with Breakthrough Performance Group. We're a local company. Um, we do basically uh, training, consulting within the umbrella of process improvement. Some of our main areas are, of course, Lean Six Sigma, project management. Um, and then really almost anything under the process improvement umbrella, okay? Executive coaching, business strategy, those kind of things too. Uh, today we're going to have a uh, high-level overview of Lean and Six Sigma. And in the past you probably heard of Lean or Six Sigma, and they're still Lean or Six Sigma. But what you're, trying, what you're seeing now uh, because of the tools and their applications, you're starting to see more Lean Six Sigma. So they're kind of melding together to be able to use uh, both tools, both Lean and Six Sigma tools, to ferret out basically streamline operations, eliminate waste out of the system, but then also use data to help make the, uh, performance improvements within your organization so that we can move forward and then use data to measure our performance as we track uh, towards our goals, okay? Um, Lean and Six Sigma, a lot of the concepts are not anything new. Matter of fact, a lot of it is common sense. But what do we find about common sense in business? Sometimes it's not that common, right? We tend to be more um, designated to our particular job descriptions. Our job descriptions are a little more narrowed. We are not utilizing uh, people's skills and experience as broadly as they, they can be applied. And then we're also goaling people differently, right? We have certain goals that may still align with the company's objectives, but maybe we're not talking about how everybody wins and then how everybody fits into the ultimate goal, if you will, of, uh, for the company and how we all work together towards those uh, common goals. So we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about that today. We're going to talk about some of the tools that are used as well. Um, and then at the end, a little bit about some of the applications or just examples of some of the applications uh, of Lean and Six Sigma and where, where or how they might be used and some of the outcomes there. Okay? So I will kind of go through this a little quickly. Feel free to speak up if you have any questions. Uh, but we are going to um, kind of move through these uh, fairly quickly, OK? Um, so as I said, we're BPG here. So with Lean and Six Sigma, and I should probably be over here, I think, um, we talk about uh, a definition for Lean and Six Sigma. This is our definition, as succinctly as we could get it. And as you can see, it's a data-driven, customer-focused, problem-solving methodology 
for continuously improving measurable performance issues. Okay? Obviously, customer focused. We start with the customer. The customer's requirements are what we're keying on here, so we need to understand what the customer's requirements are and basically understanding how we can meet those. Um, it's data driven, so we're utilizing data to understand how we're currently performing against the customer's requirements, so getting that baseline, and then how do we measure to, uh, as we put uh, plans and uh, processes in place so that we track our performance improvement over time and ultimately meeting those goals. And then lastly, as you can see, uh, a continuous improvement. This is a continuous improvement methodology. It's not just about putting a, a fix in place or a, or a solution for a point in time. We want to focus on continuous improvement, uh, especially now with global competition and so forth. It makes more sense that we strive to better understand uh, our customers' uh, needs and requirements moving forward. And as you all know, um, our customers' needs change all the time. So does competition. So we need to be aware of what, uh, what our customers' requirements are and how we're performing against the customers' requirements. Okay? So when we talk about Lean and Six Sigma and tracking performance, we start with quality. Okay? And when, usually when we go and speak with a company, we ask them what quality means. Okay? One of the issues we see is that when we do ask companies what quality means, especially the employees, we tend to get different answers, right? <clears throat> Making my boss look good, shareholder equity, making sure we hit our bonus uh, targets and, and max outs, making sure that our benefits are uh, staying staying in place and, and they're not changing for the worse. And many times it is a focus on the customer, the customer's requirements. But we need it to be that. We need to understand what the goals are for the organization and what the customer's requirements are because that's why we're in business. If we don't meet the customer's requirement, we're probably not going to be in business very long. Okay? So we want to be an ongoing con uh, going concern in terms of our, of our business and our growth. Okay? Um, we talk about Webster's definition. We like Webster's definition of uh, quality. It's a distinguishing property or characteristic, uh, a distinctive trait, a degree or grade of excellence or worth. Okay? And we're talking specifically about what our company is, what we stand for, and why customer do, should you do business with us. What differentiates us from our competition, what are our core competencies, and lastly, what are our values in our, in our mission, and why should you deal with us? And if you do, what can you expect in terms of the way that you're going to be serviced, treated, what have you, okay? Very important, especially in this, uh, in this uh, uh, let's just say, a competitive and global environment that we're, that we're uh, living in, okay? So how do we manage quality, okay? We make sure that we are, well, we're trying to make sure, as it says there, that all our activities are effective and efficient with respect to the system and its performance, okay? Effectiveness and efficiency, two words that sometimes kind of get melded together. They're a little different. We can be very eff effective in meeting our customers' needs, right? We deliver on time. We we meet their specs. Um, we service them to the uh, all, to the uh, uh, to the fullest, so to speak. Okay, our vendor score, our supplier scorecards are uh, very high. We get very high marks. But are we efficient? Efficiency is a little different. More of an internal measurement. How much extra overtime did we have to utilize to meet that customer's date? Uh, how much rework did we have? How many extra people did we bring into the system than we otherwise would have in order to meet our customers' needs? So we're talking about working capital, right? We're talking about how much extra cost and complexity we're adding to the system, okay? And that's why we're going to try to focus on those areas with Lean Six Sigma. So three areas, quality control, 
quality controls, basically we're performing a service or, a pro or, or producing a product or raw material and we're inspecting it after the fact. Nothing we could really do about uh, what we've already produced or, or uh, provided to the customer. We're going to make changes as we, as we go forward, okay? Quality assurance, now we have some information, uh, some basic requirements, so to speak, from the customer. And uh, maybe there are some things that we can do that we can implement within the process to uh, alleviate some of those problems, okay? So I come from the food industry. My background uh, is food and consumer goods and a small stint uh, in uh, medical devices. And uh, most of my professional tenure was with H.J. Uh, Hines, Starkist Foods Division here in town. And um, with the tuna business, um, we talk about several different steps to ensure uh, that there's no foreign objects, metal detection, same with a lot of ingredients that are being used uh, with a lot of different products. So those are steps that are put in place to try to alleviate issues from getting passed along downstream in the process. One of the other, at least when, uh, when I was with uh, Starkist, was a manual system where um, once the fish was eviscerated, <coughs> uh, mostly women, because women have a better sense of smell than men, they had the pleasure of running their hand through the fish to make sure it was fresh. They were the fish smellers. So uh, if you're not happy with your job, believe me, that was not the job you wanted, right? Okay? But that was basically the only way at the time that they could ensure that, um, that freshness was going to be part of that. Okay, and Charlie, the tuna, right? We don't want tuna with good taste. We want tuna that tastes good. <laughs> and then lastly, we move to quality improvement. Before it was more about the product or the service. Now we're looking at the process. What is inherent in the process that we can affect to alleviate these issues from happening so that, number one, we, can we prevent them from happening in the future? Or at a minimum, can we detect them so we don't pass along these non-conformances or defects downstream in the process. Okay? Make sense? All right. So where is Lean and Six Sigma applied today? We'll pick an industry. Okay? It started in manufacturing. A lot of people still think it's a manufacturing uh, strategy. But it applies to almost every uh, uh, industry out there. Okay? Like I said before, I initially, I'm a finance and marketing guy, um, worked pr predominantly uh, in finance at, uh, at Heinz and then got involved with uh, um, the international side of the business and then got onto the brand management side and product development and so forth, okay? But uh, we used back then TQM, we'll talk about that a little later. Um, we were all about TQM. Well, during my tenure there, okay? But pick an industry that doesn't use uh, Lean or Six Sigma. And the reason is this. What if you went to, uh, say you were the person uh, responsible for communicating to your uh, company shareholders. Thank you for being here today. Um, due to um, market competition, global commodity pricing, uh, and uh, specific uh, pressures within our industry, we foresee that our business will be down 2 to 3% for the next five years. Thank you. How would that go over in your companies? Not very well, right? If you're headed to the door, just keep walking, right? Just keep walking. How do we do more with less? Our budgets are slashed. Okay. We have fewer people, human resources, uh, in the system now. We're, we still need to grow our business. We need to, be, uh, uh, we need to prosper. Uh, we need to be profitable. How do we do more with less? Okay, and I don't think there's probably any one of us who haven't been touched by that in one form or fashion. Okay, so pick an industry. Nonprofits, I'll say in particular, have been hard, uh, hit hard the last dozen years or so. So we have many fewer donations. We have much fewer, uh, many fewer volunteers. 
we still want to make an impact in the communities that we serve. How do we do that with less? And again, that's a direct parallel with what's going on in corporate America as well. Okay? So we're going to uh, get into Lean and Six Sigma here. When we talk about Lean and Six Sigma, we generally want to start with a Lean engagement. With Lean, we're going to get a high-level overview to start. We're going to understand the key steps of the process, key four to six main steps in the process. I understand where we have issues. And then we're going to try to drill down into those and try to streamline that process, if we will. Okay, identify where we have, as we'll call it, waste or nonconformance uh, in, in the process. So here, Lean is a systematic continuous improvement approach to help drive value to the customer through flow improvement and waste elimination. So how do we improve flow within our process and eliminate wasteful steps or activities out of the process? Okay. Um, it's also known as the Toyota production uh, system. Okay, Toyota, you'll hear a lot about Toyota um, uh, when we talk about Lean in particular. But uh, obviously, your companies don't want to call it the Toyota production system. So most companies have developed their own acronym and their own terminology. Okay. So when we talk about flow, what impacts flow? How do we get a consistent flow through the system without having uh, a lot of static, if you will, uh, in, in the process, a lot of stopping and starting? So overburden or unreasonable workloads or unevenness or inconsistent workloads. Have any of you dealt with tack time or cycle time? So how long does, how long, given what the customer requirements are, how long does, should it take us to meet that customer's requirement? The flip side is, once we get that, how long is it actually taking us to cycle work, if you will, or product or service through our organization, through our processes, okay? And the goal is for those two to be equal, if we can. And they're based on supply and demand. Tack time is a demand-driven uh, uh, calculation. Cycle time is a supply, basically. How long it takes you to meet the customer's supply. Or demand, I'm sorry. The demand. So tack time is a, is a demand uh, strategy. Cycle time is a supply strategy. Okay. So overburden or unreasonable workload. So maybe we have too much going on within one step of the process. Okay? In, and maybe there we need to reallocate resource into that area. Okay? Or maybe there's too much going on in that step. Okay? Maybe we need to break out some of the work into another step or into another process upstream so that we can facilitate getting our cycle time and our tack time basically as close to one another as we can. Okay? Unevenness will be observing the process at a higher level for every step of the process and see how long it takes for each step to create work uh, or raw materials, if you will, or inventory to pass along uh, to the next step. So we want those to be consistent throughout. So we talk about tack time. Uh, and cycle time. Cycle time, as we said, is um, supply driven. Dema uh, tack time is driven by demand. Okay? So we're trying to get our supply and our demand to equal or less. Okay? So when we talk about lean, it is about eliminating waste out of the process. So there are eight categories of waste. In your little handouts there, you'll see there's a page that talks about the eight wastes. Uh, number one, defect, scrap, and rework. So if we have product that doesn't meet or, or work that doesn't meet our customers' uh, requirements, then some of that may be scrap. Or we're going to rework. We're going to redo something uh, or some part of that work or re rework that product, um, which is going to cost us a little more complexity, putting uh, those raw materials through the system again. Okay, so we're adding cost and complexity to the system. Overproduction, near and dear to my heart. Um, 
with overproduction, it's making more than the customer needs, um, short of a small amount of safety stock, right? We, we have some capacity. We're probably going to have some uh, safety stock. But um, getting to a, to a system where we have our customers demand pull work through our process. So uh, in many companies that we work with, uh, work at, um, we overproduced, right? Because we knew that our yields were not 100%. They were 90 something sometimes, maybe at first 80 something. So basically, we plan more raw materials to come into the system to alleviate this issue. <laughs> but it's costing the company money, right? That's why, that's why it's one of, the, one of the biggest ways, because most companies, that's what we do. We add more raw materials to the system to accommodate our uh, throughput, which is less than 100%. Okay. Uh, waiting, another huge waste. So when you have one step of the process that waits so that people can do their next step of the uh, work, then that's, that's, a, that's a big waste. Okay. So, uh, we want this fluid system so that when, when, one, when uh, one process finishes, the next uh, process can, can do their job. Okay. Not fully utilizing people. I think this is probably one of the worst uh, ways because uh, I fully believe that most people are only used about 65 to 70 percent of their capacity, not in terms of time, but in terms of uh, their abilities and skills. Okay. Most companies, we have narrow, narrowly defined job descriptions. We want people to be experts in specific areas. We don't really utilize their entire uh, skill set um, in order to um, problem solve, grow our businesses, get involved with understanding the customer's requirements to the level that we need. Okay. Transportation. Now we're talking about physical goods, right? So how many times are we moving product, both internally or externally, in the process to get it to the customer? In my past life, we had, especially in Heinz and our customers and our distributors, and then the distributor may have had a sub-distributor, and then warehouse, and sent another warehouse, and then the customer's warehouse. So how many times are we moving product through the system to accommodate getting that final inventory to the customer. Now with uh, a lot of our retailers consolidating and demanding that they don't want to hold a lot of inventory, the just-in-time system, right, has really kind of changed um, the, the, um, the game in, uh, when it comes to logistics and transportation. So now we have fewer layers of transportation, fewer people involved in the process, more direct store delivery, cross-docking, you name it. Uh, coming into play. So a lot of that is starting to go away, but I would tell you, you'd be surprised with some companies that you probably know um, how much waste there is in that system still. Okay. Inventory. Uh, inventory short of a, a small amount of safety stock, safety stock, and especially if it's forecasted, is waste. Okay. We see this all the time. Not only is it waste, it's money sitting on your balance sheet. Inventory is sitting on your balance sheet and we can't do anything with that money because it's tied up in inventory. Okay, So that's why just in time and lean really started to take hold uh, more in the 80s and 90s. <clears throat> but again, helping companies to alleviate that need to hold so much inventory and going to more of a just in time system. Okay, Motion. Now it's about people. How often are you getting up to find documents, tools, whatever the case might be, instead of having them uh, at, your, at your office, your workspace, um, and so forth. So uh, one company we did business with, they were, uh, their office personnel were up almost two hours every day looking for things. Okay, That's a lot of waste. What are you looking for? Ah, I got to go to the printer. How about you? Uh, I need to go get some documents. How about you? I can't find whatever the case might be. So everybody's kind of uh, 
walking around looking for things. And how many times does that happen on a daily basis? Okay. So we want to have the things that we need, especially if we use them every day or every other day, what have you, very frequently. Those should be at your uh, disposal or within reach of 30 seconds or so. Okay. We want to have the tools that we use often available to us so we're not getting up and waiting. Printers is another one, right? We have a centralized printer for our, our, our department. How many times are, hey, I'm printing it off the 140 pages. OK, uh, where's my first 25? I don't know. Look in the trash. Look, look at that pile of paper sitting next to the printer, right? Because it's not anyone else's thus far. So you can look through that too. So again, a lot of wasted time in motion. Go back, maybe print it again because you can't find it. But that, that is a real problem in many companies. And lastly, excess processing. So this is putting a product or service through steps that you feel add value, but the customer really could care less about, or it doesn't add value to them. And not to pick on the IT industry, we're talking about Microsoft Bundle, right? OK, how many applications are in a Microsoft Office suite, so to speak? Eight, something like that. How many of them do you use? I'd say in my past life, probably three to four max, maybe five pushing it, right? But we're paying for all of it, but it's a value. But again, uh, we're, we're paying for that. We're paying for that, even though we're not use, utilizing it, OK? Just one idea, right? So these are the eight ways. And as you can see, uh, the acronym down the, down the front there spells downtime. So it's all about downtime, OK? Trying to reduce downtime, waiting, or any one of these wasteful areas. So some of the goals with Lean. Customer satisfaction. Obviously, if we don't meet the customer's requirement, we're not going to be in business very long, as we said before. Uh, creating that flow, as we said before. Uh, or going to more of a just-in-time scenario where once a order comes in from the customer, then we're supplying whether it's a service or a product to the customer on a timely basis. So we're basically working backwards to meet that need. Okay? Um, making sure that our cycle time equals our tack time. Making sure that our demand, our, our supply equals our demand. Okay? Cycle time and tack time. So we shouldn't carry, a, we shouldn't have to carry a lot of inventory because we are uh, becoming more consistent and we understand our processes better to where, yes, we're gonna, we may have some excess inventory, but it's not going to be there very long because we know of our customers' order cycles, order patterns. We're doing uh, much more planning up front to make sure that we can uh, control the process better. Okay. We want to optimize the value stream, as we said. Um, so eliminating waste at every step of the process so that we are more fluid and we create flow within every one of our processes. Okay. And if you actually eliminate waste, you will reduce cost. Most of our companies have cost reduction programs. With Lean, we're kind of looking at it the other way around. We have wasteful processes. So if we eliminate waste out of the system, then the byproduct will be reduced cost. Okay. So very much the same, but just a little different spin on that. Okay. Continuous and sustained improvement. Of course, we we don't want to um, we don't want this to be a fix, a short-term solution. We want it to be sustained going forward. That's why a lot of companies are spending a lot more time now on sustainability program, uh, using data to monitor how they're performing against their requirements over time. Okay. We want to build quality into the system. So as we said before, it's looking at the process and where we have bottlenecks and other issues in waste, wasteful processes, as we said, and how do we eliminate those out of the system so that we do have um, built-in quality, right? We don't have defects getting, along, uh, getting passed along downstream. Cash management and preservation. Well, whenever we can show our, our leadership how 
much less money is involved in running our businesses, that's a good thing, right? Maybe I'll get them to invest a little more in a lot of these efforts that we're trying to make more homegrown type of improvements within the organization. And then the last three here, flexibility and responsiveness and reliable, reliability, consistency, and predictability and respect for humanity. So number one, if we do eliminate waste out of the system, we can be more responsive. We're going to be more consistent because we can make better business decisions. We understand our processes and control our processes better so that we can plan for the future, make realistic types of uh, uh, decisions going forward that suit our business and our mission and our goals. Okay? And then lastly, respect for humanity, as we said. Um, it's people who drive the system. Okay? It's people who are going to decide the level of uh, improvement and whether we meet our goal and the level of success that we have with any project. So we need to work together. We need to have trust and respect for everyone in the value chain so that we do work together and make sure that we meet this goal. And that's a two-way street. That's a two-way street, right? Our leadership needs to be involved and respect the, uh, the team and, and, uh, and others in the, uh, in the process, frontliners and, and the middle management. And the other side is uh, that um, the expectation that everyone who are involved in these types of initiatives also then um, do, as I say, do what they say they're going to do. Or they're going to work together to try to solve these problems. Okay? Do what you say what you're going to do. One of the most important things I learned in business. Okay. So how do we achieve lean? Uh, again, you have a handout. It kind of shows these are some of the more popular tools that are used in lean. So value stream mapping, have, have you used value stream mapping before? Have you? Oh, OK. Oh, all right. Yeah, we forgot to say if you have a question, get the mic so the folks online can hear. <laughs> Is that the same as what they used to call process flows? Yeah, process flow, yeah. yeah um, I, process flow mapping. Yes. Yeah, very similar to that. So this is one that was done in uh, Visio. But generally, when you start, you basically go into a room, you have the team assembled, you look for the longest wall, you get some post-its, and you start going to town, and you really map out the process at a detailed level. You'll first start with a high-level map, but now we're going to map out every step of the process, especially in the area where we have these issues, OK? And we're going to get some information uh, in each of those areas, too. How many people are involved? How long does it take? Uh, how many parts or services are done on, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Whatever is pertinent to that. How many shifts do you run? Okay. <clears throat> so here, just to show you, and, and post-it notes work well because it, mo it motivates people to speak up. They're, the, they're on the team because they're subject matter experts, <clears throat> so we want to hear from them. Okay. We don't want to assume uh, what goes on in that process. We want to observe it first, and then we're going to map it. Okay. What's interesting here, <clears throat> you see uh, here at the bottom, <clears throat> the upticks and the downticks, that, that basically in this process here has to do with wait time is the uptick. The downtick is the um, actual value-added processing time. So this is a stamping and assembly facility here. <clears throat> and I'm not going to go through the whole process here, but the uh, entire uh, lead time for production is 23 and a half days. <clears throat> the value added processing time is 188 seconds, so just over three minutes. Okay? And if you look here with the uptakes, up at the start here, so when the raw, uh, raw materials come in, we have waiting of five days. We have product sitting in inventory for seven and a half days. Then next step, 1.8 days, 2.7 days, two days, and then lastly, four and a half days. This whole process, after some planning and execution on a, on a project, got down to four and a half days. So again, it has to do with utilizing our people, uh, understanding where our, where our 
uh, in this case, our weighting or bottlenecks might be <clears throat> in trying to reduce those. Okay? Make sense? Let's go back here. Okay, so also <clears throat> another tool is com the Kanban system. Have you used Kanban system before? Or a, in a just-in-time scenario? So Kanban is a Japanese word for card. And it started with basically a visual tool of replenishment. <clears throat> okay, so it was a card. And then it became maybe an empty bin or an empty uh, uh, tote that's passed along upstream to notify people that they need replenishment. Okay, in my, in my days, it wasn't about really from a production scenario, uh, but for marketing flyers, brochures, and so forth, we used cards to show when we got into certain level of inventory in our mail rooms, they called the fulfillment house to uh, have more scent. They didn't have to talk to me or others because we've already worked out the system to where if there were changes in the process, they were all be already being, uh, they were already in process, they were already being made. We didn't have to wait. Same thing with our, ware our print warehouses or our fulfillment centers. They don't have to wait. If they got to a certain inventory level, they knew just to call the printer and have more printed. They didn't have to call me or my colleagues uh, because everything was already uh, in the system. Okay? But it's, that, it's a very popular and very powerful tool, basically so we don't have waiting, trying to alleviate waiting and bottlenecks in the system. 5S, another very popular tool and very important tool. Has anyone used 5S? Okay. So 5S, obviously five steps to the process here. Sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. Basically, it's trying to remap the flow to make it more efficient uh, uh, of a process. This could be used for uh, a plant, manufacturing plant. It could be used for an office environment. Uh, as I spoke with a couple of you before we started today, my wife is a hoarder, <clears throat> so my home office I couldn't use for over a year and a half because there was so much junk uh, in there. Um, but we 5 vest our basement, so I'm happy to say for the last uh, seven and a half, eight months, I've been able to use, use my home office. So now we're working on the garage. So it doesn't have to be uh, strictly for... Uh, a business environment could be used in your own homes. Um, labeling, using labels to um, understand where we have uh, inventory or where your uh, um, cups and, and uh, plates are, whatever the case might be. So, visual tool or in a in a uh, industry or in a company basis, uh, your common print areas and so forth might have taped outlines. So where everything is visible and can be seen, and God forbid you took out that uh, commercial grade stapler or three-hole punch because there's going to be one admin who's in charge of making sure that that goes nowhere, right? So now they're going to be after you. Okay, so it's about laying out the process the way it should be most efficient for everyone to use, especially those common areas. So we start with sort where we sort what's needed from what's not needed, okay? and we tag it, where it came from, what it was used for, uh, and we might keep some of it around because maybe it's not used that frequently, but it is important uh, to the process. When in doubt, we throw it out. Okay? Then we, set the, the, uh, we lay out the process as it should be most efficient for us. And again, that could be a plant, it could be an office, insurance companies that do ergonomic studies use 5S a lot when we talk about um, uh, setup and, and layout of uh, office equipment and offices themselves. So now, how is it most efficient for everyone in the, uh, in the office or the plan to utilize it? And that could be where we put our printers, where we put certain uh, uh, equipment so that everyone has access and there's a flow established within, uh, within the, the process. Okay. Then shine. So now that we've planned it out but in a manner that's efficient to us, now we might want to clean up that area, some painting. Why is that? Because 
generally if we make it look nice we have a little more incentive to keep it looking nice okay so uh, we want to make it look nice but uh, especially those common areas where everyone has access but of course even your areas your offices and so forth to make it more efficient to the process okay then we standardize so we can standardize now we're looking at the system to make sure that everything's working the way it should people are following the process and so forth and then in sustain now we're going to take assessments on a regular basis to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing and the process is working the way that we expect it to work okay usually it's some kind of scorecard or assessment that's going to be done on some regular basis to show us that we are maintaining the process and, and uh, using the process and people are utilizing the process the way it's supposed to. Okay. Kaizen is another term. Kaizen is a Japanese word, actually two Japanese words. Kai is change, Zen for the better. Okay, so Kaizen started here with um, lower hanging fruit and it's also empowering your people to make changes themselves, not having to run it up the flagpole to several levels of authority to make changes. But uh, it could be the same thing. So Kaizen here in the States were um, not that uh, willing to wait. So Kaizen Blitz has taken on a, uh, a, ter a term uh, to mean rapid improvement. So we want, we want changes and we want people to act on them, but we want to act on them quickly. Um, so we might have a three to five day engagement where we're tied into this process. People are full, uh, used fully during that time and making sure that they're going to uh, come up with, a, with an, a, a solution to our problem. Okay? We may not actually get to the execution, but at least to the plan as to what we're going to do going forward within those three to five days. Okay? Very effective. Again, everyone's time and energies are fully focused uh, on that event during that time. Uh, Built-in quality or judoka. So here, earlier as we were talking about having measures in place in the system to alleviate issues from getting passed along downstream. Okay? And taking that to another step, error proofing or pokeyoki, as it's called. Now we're trying to eliminate as many errors out of the system as we can, especially human error, right? So uh, some of the examples we use in our classes are uh, your flash drive only goes into your computer one way, right? Hopefully. Now they've pokey up that even further where a lot of new computers and so forth can receive that flash drive either way. Although what I've seen is uh, because of that, they may not be held as a fixed as they used to be in the past. But it, it can work that way, especially with the USB 3.0s and so forth. Um, or uh, you have an unleaded vehicle, you're not paying attention, you're at the gas station, <clears throat> and uh, you pick up the diesel nozzle, you're still on your cell phone, and uh, you try to stick it in your tank. What happens? Yeah, it doesn't fit. It used to fit. used to, used to be catastrophic to your car, right? Your engine would probably cease working uh, and would cost you a lot of money to either replace an engine or get it fixed. Nowadays, the nozzle is larger on a diesel, uh, uh, diesel uh, nozzle at uh, the gas tank, so it doesn't fit into your tank. Unfortunately, unleaded nozzle does fit into a diesel vehicle, so be careful. Okay. All right. um, and then work cells, as we said here. So uh, oh, also with Pokeo, it could be automation. We could be adding um, standardization and automation to the system to try to alleviate those uh, problems because now um, people are doing things the same way, right? Me working to a standard or a certain process. And that, that will also help to eliminate defects as well. And then work cells. So now we have created a team of people who are cross-trained and they can work on several different functions instead of one specific task to accommodate work. And it also helps to eliminate bottlenecks, um, especially in the system, but also if people are missing to or out of work, we can reallocate resources much better, especially due to proximity now, to accommodate a lot of these tasks. And then lastly, as we said, trust. Trust is a big one. Trust and respect. 
we need to trust the system. We need to trust and respect the people that we work with and be professional um, so that we can work towards uh, meeting these goals and working towards uh, the proper solution or the right solution, if you will. Okay. So with Lean, basically, this is the process. The customer specifies value through their requirements. What are the requirements that we need to meet? Okay. Then we identify the value stream. What are the steps in the process that we're going to follow? And where within those steps of the process do we have waste or non-value added activity? And we want to identify as much of that as we can and then try to eliminate it from occurring in the future. Okay. Then we create flow. So now now we have a fluid system. We don't have a lot of bottlenecks. We don't have a lot of stopping and starting or waiting within our process, okay? So that we are fluid. We've created flow, as we said, moving towards that um, just-in-time scenario. And then lastly, um, customer pull. So when we get to that level now, we have our customer pulling uh, work through the system, through their demand. So when they submit an order, Okay, now that pulls work through our system instead of having a bunch of products supplied and then uh, it's sitting in our warehouse and then we're discounting product to move it. Uh, but somewhere along the line, somebody's got some efficiency yield, right? I was part of that in the past, right? We produce a bunch of stuff. We have favorable variances in the plant. Well, we've got to hold that inventory. So now we have storage costs. So we just displaced that cost to someone else, right? It's, it's not on, a, on our books, and we're not going to be gold on that. Someone else is, right? So the idea is eliminating waste to do the entire step uh, process, okay? And then lastly, pursue perfection. So now we test it out. We sustain this new improvement that we made. We use measurements to show that we're sustaining it, but we also want to do the postmortem, as I say. What worked well, what didn't work well, what else could we do right now to make further improvements on what, what we just uh, accomplished? Or what other, what other steps could we take going forward to um, further uh, improve the process? So it, that's the continuous improvement piece there. We always are looking to make, um, make improvements to whatever, uh, whatever the system uh, has uh, already been planned. Okay, James Womack, <clears throat> uh, he and his colleagues, uh, they were uh, statisticians at uh, MIT. They also coined the term lean. They wrote a few books, one called, well, Lean Thinking, which is kind of a staple in the lean uh, area. He, they also wrote a book called um, The Machine That Changed the World, if you heard of that book. So he... He and his colleagues looked at the auto industry, I think in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken, looked at um, the US, Japan, and Europe, and they saw the biggest discrepancy was between the US and Japan, where the Japanese were building car in almost half the time, almost half the cost, and almost ha uh, twice the quality. So um, kind of incredible, right? Um, but again, a lot of US companies started to get on board to understand what is it about these products coming into our market that are so attractive to our customers and making those changes and understanding what what those requirements are again okay so to summarize lean we talk about eliminating non-valued activity out of every step of the process as we said making sure that the customer gets what they want when they want it with minimal waste, okay? So quiz time for you. So does your customer pay for waste or only value added activity? Your customers pay for waste? Sure they do, we have inefficiencies in our, in our processes, so we pass that along in our costs, otherwise we wouldn't make any money, right? So we pass along those wastes, if you will, or inefficiencies through our pricing to the customer. Do our customers want to pay for waste? Do you as a consumer want to pay for waste? Surely we don't. We know we do, but we're not too very happy about that either. So, okay. 
So these are kind of the underlying concepts of lean. Okay? So it's about streamlining the process, identifying waste, making sure that we can um, be effective and efficient when it comes to meeting our customers' requirements. Okay? So we're going to jump into Six Sigma real quick here. So with Six Sigma, we use, now we're going to bring some data to the table, even more so than we did in Lean. We're going to use some statistics to show our baseline performance. We're going to use data to help us understand not only our baseline, but the impacts uh, or the correlation, if you will, between some of the issues that we have and how big of an impact they make to our current processes. And then trying to come up with solutions and use data to show which ones will be the most impactful there as well. And then lastly is an organizational strategy. So here when we talk about Six Sigma, it's looking at the data, right? And uh, the Greek symbol sigma, sigma there stands for standard deviation, which basically uh, talks about the variation of your data from the mean, okay? And here uh, Motorola did a lot of the initial analysis when it came to uh, Six Sigma. As a matter of fact, they coined the term Six Sigma. But here, you can go out three standard deviations, plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean. And if, if you can do that and still meet your specifications, then, you, then you're within control. So it's about statistical process control. Uh, historically, through the empirical rule, uh, three sigma process is a process capability of one. So in theory, one of these um, normal uh, bell curves could fit within your process exactly once and still be in control, if you will. Okay? With a Six Sigma process, we would basically have that bell curve much tighter. So theoretically, you could fit two bell curves of that same uh, process, performance, within your upper and lower spec limits and you're still in control. Okay? So it would be a much tighter bell curve here. Don't get too caught up in this. Is just to show that the data spread here, generally 68% of the data is found within plus or minus one standard deviation. 95.45 is between two plus or minus two standard deviations. And then 99.7 uh, within plus or minus three standard deviations. And this is obviously, quote, it goes into infinity, so to speak. Uh, here. That's why you see the curves kind of going out further. Okay? Don't, don't get too caught up in the math here. Okay? Uh, when we talk about Six Sigma, it is about our level of performance, and it started in high volume manufacturing. Okay? So is our process in control, and how many defects do we have? Whether it's a product or a service. So here, the historical standard was three sigma, roughly 93.3% error-free, if you will, in our system. Uh, and again, since this started in high volume manufacturing, DPMO stands for defective parts per million opportunities. That's still 66.8 thousand defects per million. Okay. The current standard is a little more than four sigma. 99.4% uh, error-free, so to speak, 6,200 defects per million, okay? And then there's five sigma, six sigma, and so forth. And many companies are already past six sigma, okay? We talked about um, error-free. At a six sigma standard, you're talking about 99.9997% error-free. That's 3.4 defects per million, or two parts per billion. Okay, so again, we're talking about moving to as as close as we can get to six sigma or better. But that doesn't mean we need to be there, nor does it mean we aspire for that, right? But we have inefficiencies in our process. There are some companies, as I said before, that are past six sigma. If you look at the aviation industry. Uh, pharmaceutical industry, um, medical device industries, many of those companies are past Six Sigma. W why do you think that would be? Yeah. 
risk, right? Risk and exposure. Even 3.4 defects isn't good enough. It could, probably, it could be catastrophic to an organization. So um, we, need to, we need to do better than that, OK? OK, so now we're getting to basically the heart of Six Sigma. There are two uh, processes, if you will, very much the same, designed for Six Sigma, which is basically a conceptual uh, process for the design of a new product or a system. And it was uh, a lot of people uh, claim that this was the precursor to Agile in the IT areas. Okay, So conceptually, how do we take the customer's requirements and create a process that, that will meet that need? And that not just for IT, of course. Obviously, when we have a new facility, new, uh, new processes, new uh, service that we haven't been involved with, where we could use um, Design for Six Sigma as well. The other one is a redesign of an existing process, and that's the DMAIC process um, here. So um, the, the acronym for the Design for Six Sigma stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, Design, and Verify or Validate. Since we don't have a model to look at, we're 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 creating that model, if you will. Okay. We spend most of our time in the latter, in the DMAIC process, because most of our companies have processes, and we're going to redesign those processes. Okay. So the DMAIC process there stands for define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. Okay. So we want to make the improvement. And we want to control it. We also want to analyze because we want to understand what the main components are that are driving this uh, this performance for us. Okay. So we're going to go over the ladder here. So with define, we define the problem. What is the problem? What is the pain to us? What is the pain to the customer? Okay. And then what is the impact of that pain? Okay. You generally come up with what's called the project charter. And it has a few components. One is the problem statement. There's a goal statement. Okay, and then maybe a uh, business, a short business case of why we're identifying this project and why we're going to work on it now. Maybe the deliverables. Aside from the goal, what are some of the deliverables that we're looking to uh, to also uh, identify out of this uh, out of this process? Who might be part of the team is going to be key. You might even uh, put together a high-level process map uh, as part of the, um, the project charter as well. And then a timeline as to how long, each, how long you expect at first for the uh, five steps of the DMAIC process to take. Because we want it to be time-bounded and measurable. Okay? We know that the longer a project takes, and if we don't set a timetable, we get stuck in a cycle. And many times we tend to lose interest because we're not moving forward. We need to have a sense of urgency when it comes to, to these types of initiatives. Okay. So now that we've identified our problem and the, the impact of that problem, now we're going to measure, we're going to look at our baseline. How are we doing against that requirement? Okay. We're going to bring more data to the table, a lot of different data analysis that can be used, run charts, control charts, histograms, you name it. There's a lot of data uh, tools that can be utilized here. But basically, we're, we want to understand how we're performing against the requirement. Okay? And uh, we'll also probably do a, a value stream map or, or a detailed process map, a flow map, to understand each of the key steps of the process that are that are impacting our performance. Okay? And then we're going to look at the goal and that we know how we're performing against that goal. Is it still realizable? Because we want the goal to be achievable. We want it to be a little bit of a stretch. If it's too easy, then why are we utilize, you know, taking up so many people's time to work on this project? But we do want it to be achievable. If we don't, if we know that we're not going to achieve that goal, 
that's also very demotivating to the team, right? How many people, once they've been through that process, will want to be involved in another one of these process improvement initiatives going forward? Generally, they won't. So we want to try to uh, understand what that goal is and then use it as a benchmark as we move forward through the process. Okay? And analyze. Now we're going to do some root cause analysis. We're going to identify the vital few from the trivial many, so to speak. What are the key drivers to our current level of performance? And, and we can, if we can identify those, then we can come up with solutions to uh, identify there. Have you ever heard of the book, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? Right? So little kids ask why all the time. Mommy, why is this? Daddy, why is that? We kind of brush it aside. It's cute. Then we get into business, and we ask why we do things the way that we do, and what is usually one of the answers we get? This is how we do things here, right? This is our process, and it works. Oh, okay. How long have you been doing it this way? Okay. So you're telling me your competitors haven't changed, your customers' requirements haven't changed, the industry hasn't had changes, technology hasn't changed, everything's been the same for the last you know, 15, 20 years, whatever the case might be, right? We want to ask why. We want to understand that. And maybe there's a better way, as we said. Maybe there is a better way to do things now, okay? So we're going to identify those key contributors there. We're then going to, now that we understand those key contributors to our, to our performance, now we're going to go back to that goal statement and understand knowing what, how we're performing and what are the drivers of our performance, of our current level of performance, does it make sense that that, that goal uh, is kept or do we amend that goal? Okay? And generally, not in every case, but in most cases, we're going to draw a line in the sand in the analyze phase because we have most of the information that we need to make a fairly educated decision about that goal. Okay? Then we move into the improve phase. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in the improve phase, now we're going to come up with solutions to mitigate that, those problems that we have, especially those areas that we feel are very impactful. So aside from brainstorming, which is used in almost every project that I, I've been involved in, um, and it's because you know, we're, we're putting no limits, right? We want ideas first, and they can be bad ideas too. But then we'll bring some criteria to the table to help to uh, uh, limit that or start working or working that uh, that list down to the vital few again. Okay. So we want to make sure that we're going to come up with the solutions that are going to be the most impactful. Okay. Again, we'll use data, maybe some regression analysis, maybe some hypothesis testing, uh, design of experiments failure mode and effects analysis. There's several different tools. I'm just mentioning a few. But we want to basically get down to our short list here. And then we're going to test out that solution. We're going to make sure that it works to the level that we need it to work. And if not, maybe we'll tweak it here in the improve phase. Okay. So once we've come up with our solution and we'll come up with a plan, uh, to, to run that pilot, if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now we're going to implement. Now we're going to execute the plan. And here, as it says, we're going to execute into the system. We're going to communicate what this new process is throughout the organization, why we're doing it, and here are the expectations that we expect going forward, and how we're going to sustain it. We're going to have a plan to sustain this. How do we report out on it? How frequently? What are the dashboard or the benchmarks we're going to use? We want to make sure that we're going to sustain this improvement going forward. We're going to hand it off to the stakeholder, generally the person who's in charge of the area where the improvement has been made. And someone in that area is going to be in charge of making sure that we're reporting out on that. Okay. It's important that we follow the process. If we follow the process, it works really well. The first four, most companies are great at. 
We're great at identifying our problems. Most of the time we have internal ideas as to what that problem might be. We have uh, really good data most of the time. Or if we don't have it, we can get it fairly quickly. We even know some of the main issues. Sometimes we don't ask for that information, right? That's part of the problem. We don't ask for it. Or those who are going to contribute that information maybe aren't being heard. And we know some of the solutions, maybe not the best solutions, but some of the better solutions. Where the rubber meets the road is control. Now we're going to execute. Several reasons to say no, right? Scope creep being one of them. We are changing the scope of the project. I work for one company, actually did a project for them, product development, product platform development. Every time they came to the table, the president would come in and he'd come in with a new requirement. And out of respect for him, because he pioneered this industry, they'd go back to the drawing board and next week they'd come back with another list of things and so would he. So it was taking them close to three, three and a half years to launch a product. And they, of course, knew who the culprit was in this case. Not that he didn't add value, but we have to move on and get version one, version two, and so forth. We need to get product out. So um, after some discussion, he took himself out of the process. He, he knew he was the bottleneck, as he called himself. Okay. But it was his baby, right? It was his baby. So sometimes we have trouble letting go. Other times it's money, right? We no longer have the money that was earmarked for this process or for this initiative. Another one is uh, uh, fear, of, fear of the unknown, right? We know how to work around the current process. What about? Uh, this new process. Now we're bringing a whole other element to the table. Maybe we don't know all the areas that might be effective. That's why we test out the system. But again, or people feel who feel they were experts in a, in a certain area now regarding that process maybe no longer feel that they are because they don't know the new system as well or the new process, if you will. Okay. So there's several reasons to say no. We need to be disciplined enough to, to follow through and get to the execution phase. Okay? If you follow the process, it will work. Then there's an organizational strategy here. Um, so we want to build the culture, ultimately, if we can. Right? We want to build a culture of quality, as we'll call it. We want everyone involved. In, within your organizations, you work for companies where um, you have your own acronyms, your, your, uh, you feel an infrastructure to where you feel like it's, you're working for something and contributing with the rest of the team or the rest of the organization. That's what we want to do. We want to continue to build on that and bring more momentum and a sense of urgency. We want people to speak up, courageous conversation as we'll call it sometimes. Okay? We want people tuned into the process and committed and motivated. Okay? And then again, at the end of the day, we want to be focused on, as it says, customer satisfaction and continuous improvement. And as we lay these foundations out, then people will adapt. Because if we communicate the expectation and measure to that expectation, we will follow that expectation. We have a saying, if you measure it, it will improve. <laughs> right? Because now people know what the expectation is. So what Six Sigma is not, it's not workforce reduction. It's not meant for workforce reduction. Okay? Unfortunately, in the last, again, decade or so, a lot of companies have cut, cut heads because there's a lot of external pressures. Uh, and uh, then they come in with some process improvement initiative. Okay? Um, we also have a lot more external pressures uh, within organizations right now. Um, we're tending to take a much shorter view when it comes to performance as well. So that has an impact as well. <clears throat> but it is not meant for workforce reduction. It's about eliminating wasteful activity 
to where we grow our businesses, we become more efficient, and then we bring, hopefully, more people into the business. And we might reallocate people, right? If, we've going, if we're going through several of these initiatives, are we going to keep the same job that we had? Maybe not. The goal is here, let's try to reallocate some of our personnel in the areas where we still have issues that we need to address. Okay? Does that mean you're going to stay in the same geography? Again, possibly not. With consolidation and competition, um, you know, the rules of the game have changed a little bit, right? But we want to try to address these issues. It is not meant strictly for cutting heads, so to speak, or reducing the workforce. It's not a quick fix either. Most companies have long-term strategies when it comes to continuous improvement. We want to build on that. But we're going to break them down into manageable pieces so that we do have some successes. We want to communicate those successes uh, within the organization, motivate people to get involved and commit to a lot of these engagements. Okay? That's, that's the idea here. And once you string along some of these more incremental improvements once you get two or three of those together that are impactful to the company. And that was the snowball effect at Heinz as well. Within the first uh, few uh, years that we had TQM going on within Heinz, uh, our stock <laughs> did phenomenally well. We were maxing out our bonuses for eight years or something like that. It was incredible. Okay, uh, But that meant everyone in the process was involved, down to mailroom staff uh, on up. It was, it was really, really neat to see. And leadership drove it. Leadership was driving that bus. Okay? So it's uh, important that they, they do that as well, and we'll talk about that more here in a minute. It's inexpensive without a return on investment. Well, it, it isn't inexpensive, right? If you're talking about new facilities, new personnel, whatever, new systems, uh, it's going to be expensive. But I guarantee you it's going to have numbers against it. If it doesn't have numbers against it, it's going to come back to you. They're going to ask for at least a three to five year outlook, if not longer, depending on the investment that you're talking about. Okay. And then lastly, long projects. <clears throat> they don't necessarily have to be long projects. We want to break them down, as I said before, into manageable pieces so that we do have some successes under our belt, and that gets more people involved in the process so that we have more people within the organization engaged in this type of activity, and that they're learning too. It, it's also part of a professional development tool, okay? So that people are involved, they're utilizing the tools, they're following the process, and now they're working together to solve problems within our organization. And that ultimately is what we're looking to get to, okay? So we talk about Six Sigma and the anatomy of a process. So this is the euphoria, right? It's a normally shaped bell curve. It's perfectly centered. And as you see there, uh, we have plenty of space on the upper and lower side of that, out of those specification limits, OK? In reality, we might see something like this, where maybe we're skewed. Uh, I did a project with a call center, and they thought their close rates, well, they had a fantastic close rate, it was 47%. They weren't happy with that, they wanted to get it to 65%. And uh, they weren't, again, they, uh, they brought me in to help with that. So they looked at the data here, and they saw a bell curve like this. <clears throat> and they said, oh, wow, we're closing people faster than we thought. And I'm like, okay, makes sense. But then someone on the team said, hey, um, do we capture the entire time we have somebody on the phone? They're like, oh, we don't know. We need to find out. So they went and asked their system people. They're like, well, we did, but we, don't, we no longer purchase that module when it comes to hold time. We didn't feel we needed it. So that person said, uh, I would argue that that's not closing close race, that's part of that. The reason that it's skewed is people are hanging up. They got tired of waiting. So they bought, actually bought the data from the, from, the, uh, uh, from the supplier and corroborated that exact story, that people were hanging up. They weren't, they weren't selling more, okay? They weren't closing people faster. They were actually 
uh, losing business, if you will. Okay? Or you might have too much variation, which is evident on what you see there on, on, the, um, on the right. So maybe we don't properly understand the, the customer's requirements. Or maybe we haven't communicated those requirements properly to our people. Okay? We need, to, we need everyone focused on that same requirement. So we need to understand what's causing that and then basically move that towards the middle, shorten up that, that curve. Here, of course, we need to move it uh, in, in, inside our uh, specifications. So sim basically, this is what we're trying to get to at the bottom here. Okay? We want to reduce the spread, as it says, and then center the process. And there are several different tools utilized to help us do that. Okay? So why is Lean and Six Sigma used so prominently together? Because the expected outcomes are very much the same. We want to understand the customer's requirements. We're going to reduce process variation. We want to perform the process consistently time after time while meeting the customer's needs. Sounds very much like the Lean objectives. And that's why Lean and Six Sigma are used very much now in tandem because they do complement one another as a, a problem-solving methodology. So to summarize here, Six Sigma is a proven methodology. It basically is reliable. It's time-bounded. It can be used to analyze all aspects of uh, all our activities and processes within uh, our control. It unifies the organization. Now we also use a common language. People are in tune to that, right? And, and we feel like we're part of something bigger. We reduce firefighting. So everything that we do, even if it's unplanned, isn't this huge fire drill, right? We can accommodate it because we are more consistent and we have built flexibility into our processes. Okay. And lastly here, we have the metrics to show that we're being consistent and we're sustaining these improvements going forward. Okay? And we're also going to show that through our financials. Okay? This graphic here is basically showing us kind of six and lean. Um, generally lean, we say, is lower hanging fruit. That's why you see it lower here. Generally fewer people, not in all cases, might be needed. Some um, many fewer resources in many cases, again, not in every case, uh, and we're streamlining the process. With Six Sigma, generally we're bringing a lot more data to the table. Uh, some of the reasons why we're bringing a Six Sigma initiative in might also be riskier and more, uh, may require more investment uh, from the company. Uh, and in the, as it says there, we're refining the process. Here's an existing process, and we're going to refine that process versus just identifying wasteful steps in the process and streamline, as we do in Lean. Okay. So, real quickly here, a Six Sigma organization. These are the uh, different roles uh, on a team. Um, executive leadership, basically, to drive the project and communicate the vision and strategy. HR, we want them to help basically drive this process and this type of uh, culture within our organization. Also help identify some of the team members and so forth. Okay. We also have corporate directors in large companies. This is your Six Sigma improvement team. Okay. And then project champion team. These are the people who prioritize. Generally, it's your leadership and they're prioritizing the projects, making sure that they have the numbers against it, making sure that um, they're prioritizing the process that meets our goals and our vision and our strategy for our company. The project teams are folks that are going to do the work. <laughs> your, your yellow belts, green belts, black belts, and they may not be called that, but putting it into a Six Sigma uh, process. And then lastly, um, the process owner. This is the person who manages the area where this improvement is being made, and uh, that area is now going to be tasked with maintaining and sustaining that improvement, okay, and reporting out as well, okay. And within Six Sigma, there are five levels. So we start with white belts, so people who have gone through a, some kind of overview, if you will, um, and there is a certification that goes along with that too. But basically getting people um, 
to use and understand some of the concepts, tools, methodologies of Lean and Six Sigma. Okay? Yellow belts, these are subject matter experts. They're going to start taking uh, part in some projects. They may not stay on the project for the duration of the project. Uh, generally, HRIT finance, sorry, that was me in the past in many cases. Um, and uh, you come in for feedback or some, to run some numbers or what provide some kind of service to the team, and then you're off the team. Now, these areas are saying, hey, we have issues in our areas. We want to become green belts and black belts. We want to solve problems in our areas, too. And that's really what's, uh, what you're starting to see quite a bit. Green belts, they are team members, and they're going to stay on the project for the duration of the team, of the, of the project, sorry. And they're also going to do most of the work. Black belt, they were team members, so they've been involved in several projects. Now they're going to start leading teams, or in much larger organizations, they will still be part of the, uh, the team uh, and uh, really work as a team member as well. It just depends on the scope. But now their role has changed a little bit. They're going to hope help drive the process forward, uh, team dynamic, uh, really lead that team uh, in these types of initiatives, making sure that we stay on track and on time as well. And then lastly, the master black belts. These are folks who've led several teams. Now their role is changing a little bit. They can still lead projects, but many times they're going to coach and train people, mentor the black belt, help with the communication with our leadership uh, to make sure that we're uh, keeping them involved and in, uh, on task and no surprises, so to speak. Okay? All right. This is the graphic of what we just saw here. Okay? Uh, here are our yellow belts, as I said before, but now they are part of this process. Okay? Some of this I'm going to leave for you all. I'm going to leave a copy of this with, uh, with you. Um, here are some possible projects that, that Six Sigma and Lean can be used for. Obviously, sales and revenues, but cost and expenses, productivity, lead time, uh, accounts receivable, uh, product development time, as I said. So pick an issue, okay? And then some of these service applications, I'll let you review too. As I said, this is not just a manufacturing methodology. It works in the service organizations as well. This is an insurance example here where uh, had to do with overpayments or leakage, as it was called, uh, of more or less, as you saw, 45%. Uh, they cut that by 25%, saving $600,000 to this company. Here, this is IT project, was employee utilization issue. So here we're talking about, again, making sure that our folks are being utilized. Um, during the time that they're at work instead of having them allocated to other projects or waiting, okay? Savings there. Here's a motorcycle dealership uh, saving $258,000 as a result of a 75% improvement. Here's uh, one that has to do with health care, having to do with the length of time it takes for someone to set up an appointment for a doctor's visit, okay? So again, could be used in any type of application. Here's a bunch of uh, manufacturing applications. As I said, I am going to leave this um, presentation, and um, it'll be shared with you all. Okay. Ultimately, we want to meet to uh, have a grand slam win, as it says. Okay. We want to obviously the, the customer to win. We want the organization to win. We want the employees to win. They need to understand how they win and how they're involved in helping the company win. And then lastly, our suppliers need to be tied in as well. Okay? Everyone in the value chain needs to be involved in these initiatives. Because if we don't properly communicate the requirement to everyone, then there's, a, again, a risk that we're not going to meet the customer's goal at one of those steps. Okay? So we need everyone involved. So. Again, to summarize, Six Sigma is a high-performance <clears throat> methodology. It does impact all areas of an organization. Leadership is critical to success. They need to drive this initiative. And they need to lead it, as we said, and they need to support it. Okay. I fully believe this. 
that all surviving successful organizations will embrace some form of Lean and Six Sigma. Many of them have, they just don't call it Lean or Six Sigma. And then lastly, the early adopters will enjoy the greatest success and capture a greater share of the market. Okay, uh, The more people, uh, organizations and people, right, understand the value and how these, these methodologies can be uh, implemented within their organizations, the more companies can succeed in driving uh, waste out of the system, but also making huge strides in performing uh, better and meeting their goals. Okay, I'll leave, I think I've said enough about this one, um, and that is our presentation. So thank you. I know that I know we went over time. Sorry, um, but uh, I appreciate you being here today. Uh, I'll stick around for a little while. Um, also, there's some information about some of our classes and upcoming classes in, in the handouts that you have there. Um, and like I said, I'm more than happy to discuss any of that or other issues with you. Uh, so I'll stick around here for a little bit. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. At a minimum, I'll give it to you if we can disseminate it at least with the proposal.